Um, Roger, my former friend Roger Fletcher, has asked me to <laughs> summarize 25 years of research in 10 minutes. And I'm pretty sure there's a napkin bet going that I can't do it. <laughs> um, what I'm here to do really is, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the warm up act for, for Brad, who really is, is the show. Um, but my intent today is to give you a flavor for why the Mackenzie is so special. And the boats are part of it, and in fact, the specialness of the river and the specialness of the boats have some interesting convergences. But really now, why should we consider building a discovery center around a river, any river? because there's, it's almost a truism that every river is different, every river is special in its own way. But what I'm here to try to give you a taste of, and it can only be a teaser, is why the McKinsey is especially special, uniquely special in some regards, and will continue to be so long into the future, long after we're gone. So with that in mind, um, it all starts with the geography. You all had geography. By the way, I, if, if there's some weirdnesses with the slides, it's because Keynote and PowerPoint don't talk to each other. Um, it all starts with the geography. It turns out that one of the reasons this river is what it is, a main reason, is that where it sits on planet Earth. And where it sits is that it drains a young, young in geological terms, not young in our terms, um, volcanic system that's been active here in this part of the world, part of the Earth, for at least the last 30 to 40 million years. That's young, geologically that's very young. The, you'll hear about the Grand Canyon, the top layer of the Grand Canyon is 225 million years old. So this is all much younger than that. But it's not just that there are volcanoes here, but there's also moisture here, in case anybody has missed this hellaciously long winter. Um, and the source of that moisture, of course, is our friend the Pacific Ocean. We have the winds, the westerly winds, that bring this moisture on board onto this, this range of mountains called the Cascades. So we have young rocks, we have abundant moisture, and that gives us, in a sense, the setup for the river that we see. But if we look closer, it's not just about the geography, it's really about a very unique geological setup, if you will. And without going into the details, the basic idea is that while there have been volcanoes here for the last 40 million years, they sort of have divided themselves in time into two distinctive flavors. And what you're seeing on the, I do have a pointer, but um, you know, here it is. Um, what you're seeing is basically the way the mountains, um, the, the, the peak up there, the peak there is of course our friends, the high cascades, those charismatic volcanoes that sit on the horizon, the Three Sisters, Mount Hood, Jefferson, and the like. <coughs> But they sit in a, a structural feature, which I won't go into the, the, you know, the jargon on, but surrounded on both sides, actually. But our concern here is the Mackenzie to the west with an older range of volcanoes. So the volcanoes were old, and now they're young. And this distinctive two-flavor landscape of old rocks that have worn, that have been eaten by glaciers, They've been carved by rivers, they've been moved by landslides, have been sort of in this, there's very little left that would let you look at it and say, well, that was a volcano. However, you just go a little bit further up the pass, and I'm sure most, most of you have been up to the top of the Mackenzie Pass, and it looks like the lava cooled yesterday. So the distinctive nature of this river comes from and is inherited by the fact that we have these two flavors operating at the same time. And 
question. And the, but perhaps the most important ingredient in this whole stew is the fact that these young volcanic rocks, these, these, these lava flows in some cases are no more than 1,500 years old of the Mackenzie, act as the most superb geological sponge that is possible to imagine. To the point that all the rain that falls, and a lot of rain and a lot of snow you know, fall here, we're talking 100 inches or more per year, particularly this year, um, all that water doesn't run off. It goes down into the ground, deep into these layers of lava flows one on top of the other. And the consequence of that is that we have here in the Mackenzie a giant reservoir of water that sits up high in the mountains and comes out slowly as the water moves through these, these subterranean lava flows and emerges as these most glorious springs, many of which are not even on a Forest Service map. And yet these springs are the absolute heartblood of the river itself. And many of you have been up to the Blue Pool or, or um, uh, the, 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 the Great Spring of the Mackenzie and Clear Lake. They're all, they come in all different sizes and shapes and colors. They're beautiful to see. They're things people write poetry about. But they are the ultimately the fundamental source of the summer water that gives life to this river. And what, so what are the consequences of having, essentially, a spring-fed river of this size and magnitude? We have to understand this is an unusually large amount of spring water coming down. Well, obviously, the first thing is that the water is cold. So if, if we had no water, if we had no springs, the temperature in the summer would oscillate back and forth from hot days and cold days, hot days and cloudy days, like you see here. What comes out of the springs, on the other hand, is this extraordinarily constant flow. And the river itself then takes on that character of the springs, and then eventually takes on heat as it moves down. But the consequence of all this is that we have a cold water fisheries that is sustained throughout the summer months. And in fact, you, know, you can map, you can often map the, prep, the geology just by knowing where the bull trout um, live. Um, so that's one consequence. Another consequence is the spring flow is extraordinarily constant. These are two different rivers, the Little North St. Anne, which was uh, Steve's, the uh, fed Steve's uh, home um, river, and the Mackenzie River. So the Little North St. Anne is the one in green. And what you see is a pattern in the winter of the river going up and down and up and down as the fronts move off that source of moisture, the Pacific Ocean. Compare that to what happens as the, as the Mackenzie comes out of Clear Lake. Very few winter rises, because, either because it's coming down the snow, but more importantly, it's going through that large hydrologic sponge. And then over the course of the summer, compare these two rivers, the San Am essentially goes away, whereas the Mackenzie is sustained throughout the year, even on a very dry year. There's always water in the Mackenzie, in part because the amount of water that's stored in the sponge is years, a year's worth of water, ten, five to 10 years worth of water. We can talk about that if you're interested. So that's another consequence. So what does this all mean? Why is this important besides just fascinating geography? Well, for one thing, this is where not just the Mackenzie but in fact, the entire western side of the Willamette Valley gets its water in the summertime. Most of the water coming out of the, the river in the summertime is coming out of a dozen springs. Whereas in the, in the wintertime, the older piece of the landscape, which is where we're sitting in now, contributes fast runoff that adds to the spring flow. So you get this, this two flavor river, spring fed in the summer, fed off the mountains in the winter. And this character, and this is where the slide should be, the, the, imagine the blue line, 180 degrees flipped horizontally. Mm -hmm. What this means is that the rivers that the Mackenzie feeds, notably the Willamette, is also carrying the signal, this, this pattern 
of the source of water all the way to Portland. If you look at the flow into Portland Harbor before the dams, 30% of the flow into Portland Harbor was the Mackenzie River. The Willamette River is the Mackenzie River in the summertime. And this, so that the entire fisheries, the entire source of water for, for two and a half, three million people who live in the Willamette Valley is coming out of a system like this. But wait, there's more. It's not just the Mackenzie. It turns out that the Mackenzie is a poster child for rivers that are also draining this young volcanic sponge up and down for all the way from, from us, uh, Mount Adams all the way to Lassen. This volcanic sponge is the reason there's water in the Sacramento, in the Rogue, in the Klamath. And whereas today you read the newspaper focuses on rivers like the Colorado that are significantly impacted by water shortage. I submit to you that this pattern of water coming out of this big groundwater system is going to be the source of western water long into the future because it's less sensitive to the vagaries of, of climate change which we're living with it. So the consequence of all that is that the Mackenzie is special not just because of what it is in itself, but what it represents to Oregon, and it is really the poster child river for the entire Western uh, uh, sweep. I want to leave you as a setup for our next speaker with one more specialness, which is one that is really the theme of today's presentation. What else is special about the river? Well, as you've heard, it is the home mother of waters for this marvelous drift boat. And I'm looking over here at the 70-year-old boat. I realize this boat is the same age as me, and it looks a lot better. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> um, we won't talk about leaking. Um, <laughs> but, but I want to, as a way of handing this, this talk off to Brad, I found myself reflecting on why was McKenzie the sort, the home water for this boat? And I submit to you that there are a number of characteristics of the river that give rise to certain characteristics of the boat. So we have a river that runs cold all year and is full of native fish. Well, that's a pretty good reason to have a boat, don't you think? <laughs> the rapids of this river are shallow and rocky, which is directly due to the fact that the glaciers and landslides that dominate the steeper part of the landscape uh, have left this residue of material in the river. And because the river is spring-fed, that material does not get cleaned out, it does not get reorganized. And so the necessity then is a boat that can, that can um, uh, navigate in this very shallow draft river uh, with gear and people. And yet there's still enough river to float the boat. Finally, the rapids here, because of all this, are congested. There's no, typically, they have no easy path. They must be navigated with style and grace. So the boat itself must have style and grace. It must be able to turn on a dime. And that gives rise to a very particular boat design with very little of the boat sitting in the river. So I submit to you that the, the cold water, the constant flow, the rocks that don't get cleaned out, the shallow draft, the congested rapids, are all brought to you by the geology. <laughs> and so with that, I would like to turn the microphone. I think I lost whoever bet on me finishing in 10 minutes, but I'm not too 